United States Supreme Court is now in session. God save the United States of America and this honorable court. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Logan Kirkpatrick, and we will be representing the respondent. I will be tackling the 14th Amendment issue in the case of Barr. Hello, my name is Morris Miles, and I will be addressing the issues that arise under the First Amendment on behalf of the respondent, the State of Olympus. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Wiedel, you'll be going first when you're ready, sir. Before we begin, we'd like to reserve three minutes for a model. So noted. At your pleasure. Mr. Chief Justice, fellow justices, and may it please the court. Good evening. My name is Emmanuel Waddell, and I, along with my co-counsel, Mr. Morger Malcolm, will be representing the petitioners, Ms. Andrea Somerville and Dr. William Denault, in the case of Barr. Later, Mr. Malcolm will be addressing the First Amendment issue. For now, I would like to direct the court to the issue of Ms. Somerville's 14th Amendment rights. Specifically, we ask this court to overturn the ruling of the lower court, and to that we give three reasons. First, Proposition 417 mandates an unnecessary and invasive medical procedure. Second, Proposition 417 unconstitutionally restricts women's access to information. And third, Proposition 417 forces women to hurdle unwarranted barriers on the path to abortion. Before I begin, would the court like a recitation of the facts? That's not necessary, thank you. Of course, Your Honor. Proposition 417 forces all women in the state of Olympus to hurdle five hoops on the path to an abortion. Taken individually, these hoops clearly struggle to pass constitutional muster. When we consider them cumulatively, the collective impact of Proposition 417 clearly constitutes an undue burden as defined by this court. So you say one by one they would not? One by one they would as well, Your Honor. When we consider the cumulative impact, it is clearly unduly burdensome. This court defined an undue burden as a regulation that has the purpose or effect of facing a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking abortion. We believe these five regulations are the transvaginal ultrasound, the script that women are forced to listen to, the fact that they must call the Department of Public Health for gathering further information about said script, the fact that they must go to the same doctor for the abortion and the ultrasound procedure, and the fact that they must pay out of pocket for the ultrasound procedure. But isn't all this uh intended to protect the health of the woman as well as uh, the health of a viable fetus? Well, Your Honor, for example, going to the same doctor and paying out of pocket in no way further that interest. Going to the same doctor does not further the health of the woman in any way. The state of Olympus mandates that all physicians in the state read a uniform script and that all physicians have been administered the same standard of care. Therefore, it's a superfluous and unnecessary provision to force a woman to go to the same doctor both the ultrasound procedure and the abortion. It stands to reason that if doctors are following the law as it's written, no matter who she goes to, she's going to receive the same information. Therefore, it should be up to the woman's discretion as to who she's going to go to to receive her ultrasound and her abortion. And if Acknowledging that the state has a legitimate interest in protecting the health and welfare of the mother as well as the unborn child, doesn't it make sense that the same physician who is advising the mother performs a procedure to develop a report? Wouldn't that advance the legitimate state interest? It may so, Your Honor. However, mandating that report does not, that does not adequately further that legitimate state interest, especially because the report cannot be developed in the state of Olympus given the straitjacket that all physicians are placed in and the fact that all physicians will give women the exact same information Excuse regarding the Under the provisions of 417, the doctor can give medical advice. Yes, Your Honor. So how is the doctor straitjacketed? 
Well, Your Honor, the level of medical advice that the doctor may give is in fact under question in Proposition 417. For example, Section 11 mentions one that the doctors may give some medical advice regarding whether or not to receive an abortion, or may not give medical advice whether or not to receive an abortion. And then Appendix 3 to Rule 3 notes that doctors may give no medical information regarding the propriety of abortion. This clearly conflicts and is vague enough that Dr. Dunant, for example, felt that he could not answer Ms. Somerville's legitimate questions about her health. If the state was truly concerned about furthering the health of women and ensuring that they could provide the most informed consent possible, it would allow them to ask doctors about these questions and receive answers to them. Ms. Somerville had legitimate health concerns about whether or not receiving an abortion could lead to cancer based upon her family history. Because Dr. Dunant could not answer those concerns, and because she was then forced to call the Department of Public Health, which refused to answer her, redirected her not to a medical expert, but to a body that that petitioned on behalf of Proposition 417, who also refused to provide with more information, this is clearly unduly burdensome. As this court noted in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, means chosen by the state to protect potential life must be calculated to inform a woman's free choice, not hinder it. Proposition, team, pr Proposition 417 clearly does the opposite. Ms. Somerville's free choice was hindered in a dangerous and irresponsible way, and this cannot be considered constitutional what by this court. What was dangerous about what she had to go through? Because she was not able to make an educated decision. If the, court is, if the state is concerned about women's mental impact, for example, <coughs> or the impact that having an abortion can have on their health, it would stand to reason that the state would want women to be as informed as possible. What does it prevent the mother from just seeking that advice from a doctor unrelated to the abortion procedure? As in, in this particular case, she went to an oncologist and received the answers to her questions. And I think even the appellate court found the doctor's concern about answering specific questions about cancer were uh, his misapprehension of the restrictions placed upon him. Well, Your Honor, the appellate court found, the, regarding the appellate court's finding, the find, other finding was regarding whether or not he could refer to her, refer her to an oncologist. However, if you know, Proposition 417, both in Rule 11 and in Appendix 3, Rule 3, do prohibit all physicians in the state from discussing <coughs> the, um, the, the studies, I apologize, the studies, not just Dr. Dunant. And forcing Ms. Somerville to go out of state, although she was able to do so, we must understand that, for example, a woman who has a low income or does not have the ability to make it out of the state would not be able to find a good oncologist and would have been unduly burdened. Wait, wait, no, let's go back. I don't see where having the doctor give this or read this script is it misleading in any other way? No, no, Your Honor, and we do not take issue with the script in and of itself. We take issue with the fact that a doctor is restricted to the script and cannot answer any questions outside of that script. It is admirable that the state of Tennessee. How does that harm the, 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 the woman? Yes, Your Honor, because if the woman has legitimate questions, for example, and some of those questions about cancer that are not answered, she's making an ill-informed decision about her health. And that's not a decision the state should further, or this court should allow the state to force upon women. So is it an ill-informed decision, or is it a decision that maybe she doesn't have all the information? It, yes, Your Honor, maybe not ill-informed as much as inadequately informed. But if the state, the state's job in this, or this, the burden the state must fulfill is fulfilling a woman's informed consent, uh, bolstering it, not hindering it. And because it hinders it, it is unconstitutional. Similarly, the fact that all women are forced to pay out of pocket for this ultrasound procedure in no way furthers a legitimate state interest. This court noted in Casey that the two legitimate state interests that can be furthered are protecting the health of the woman and the life of the mother. Who pays for the abortion procedure or the ultrasound procedure in no way furthers any interest. If Ms. Somerville pays her monthly premiums and has an insurance provider that will pay for this abortion procedure, it makes no sense that the state has any legitimate interest in preventing that private insurance provider from, pro from providing a service that it has decided it should provide for women. What about people who don't have insurance? If they would be not affected by this particular statute, Your Honor. However, this court, as this court noted in Casey as well, the constitutional inquiry begins at the group that is infected. It is not in there. So we're concerned about the women who are actually affected by this provision, i.e. those women who have insurance and are being negatively affected by the fact that they pay for insurance and cannot utilize that insurance in an acceptable way. Isn't the requirement of Proposition 417 that the mother listen to the heartbeat, that she understand the development of the fetus in terms of how far the fetus has developed at the point of determination, and that she understand the potential downstream consequences on her physically and mentally? Don't those high requirements advance the state's interest in protecting the health and well-being of the mother who may go over your time? Yeah, uh, yes, Your Honor. So once again, we don't take issue with the totality of Proposition 417. 
informed consent provisions have been held up by this court, for example, in Planned Parenthood v. Casey. However, the fact that Proposition, Team, Proposition 417 goes above and beyond any case law that this court can place or that respondents can refer to, and the fact that it places a cumulative burden upon women with all of the provisions that women are forced to so perceive in order to receive an abortion clearly makes it unconstitutional. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Malcolm, what do you want to say? My name is Roger Malcolm. I represent William Linnell, petitioner in the case of Barr. We urge the court to reverse the ruling of the 14th Circuit for three key reasons. Firstly, aspects of the compelled speech and its corresponding prohibition on response are not commercial speech, and those aspects are subject to strict scrutiny. Secondly, at strict scrutiny, Prop 417 would fill those aspects because it is not narrowly tailored. And for the other aspects where the court disagrees, even at intermediate scrutiny, Prop 417 would still fail because it doesn't further a government interest and is also not narrowly tailored. Are you saying the government has no interest in protecting the life of a mother making sure she's well informed before she has an abortion? No, Your Honor, and I have three concessions and clarifications to make up front. One, we concede that there is a government interest at stake and it is a regiment. Secondly, we concede that the government may regulate professional speech and professional conduct. And thirdly, the government may provide some material that doctors may present. The matter in this situation is not asserting or assessing if that interest exists, but the mechanism the government uses to enforce and further that interest and the mechanisms they use to regulate professional speech. Well, you concede this is professional speech. Does that mean that there's no strict scrutiny to be looked at here? So, Your Honor, there are aspects of this that the court has held to be professional speech. While we don't entirely agree, we're perfectly willing to proceed at that level because the government would still fail. But there are aspects of this that aren't professional speech to my first argument. Commercial speech is defined by Central Hudson Gas and Electric Corporation versus Public Service Corporation of New York as speech solely related to the economic interest of the speaker. In this situation, Prop 417's script fails because it forces up to the null to extol the virtues of parenthood to Andrea Somerville and any other parent patient that comes to him. This isn't economic speech, Your Honor. In fact, this is ideological speech, but therefore invoke the test established in this court by this court in Moody v. Maynard in that the government may not compel someone to become a courier of a state message even if they have an interest in that message because that would, quote, invade the space of intellect that the First Amendment was designed to protect. And therefore, that aspect of Prop 417, extolling the virtues of parenthood, is not something that is commercial in any way and strict scrutiny would be applied. It would fail. Isn't the requirement of extolling the virtues of parenthood designed to ensure that the mother understand the long-term consequences of terminating the pregnancy? In other words, that her mental health may suffer months or years later in the event that she reflects on this decision as having been a poor choice. As a result, that speech is no longer ideological but medical in nature. And since the doctor is being paid, it becomes commercial medical speech. Your Honor, two responses there. The potential risks to childbirth are already in the script, and we can see that those may be medical challenges she's very shortly. We don't find any way the virtues of parenthood to be commercial or medical because that takes a position on something is virtuous or good, and we think that crosses the threshold. And then now to go on, why even if it is professional speech, it would not meet the burdens established by intermediate scrutiny that this Court should help. You do agree that the state has a compelling interest in protecting the mother's health as well as the fetus's health? Yes, Your Honor. And on to that interest right now. So on the intermediate scrutiny, the Central Hudson Gas Test established three prongs by establishing or assessing that. One, if there's a compelling safety interest, which we concede. Secondly, if the actions further that interest, which we don't think it does. And thirdly, if it's now really tailored. To the second prong, and why Prop 417 fails. The stated interests on the record are, as you said, Justice, protecting the life of the mother and the unborn, as well as informed consent. A blanket prohibition, which I'll address why it's blanket shortly, on responding to any question about the medical validity of the studies or the propriety of the medical advice in the script, 
doesn't further the government's interest of informed consent or protecting the life of the mother or the unborn. In fact, it hampers the state's direct interest of providing more information to Ms. Somerville and other persons. The script mandates Dr. Denault to ask Ms. Somerville if she understands the different things he has said to her in the script. When she asks questions about, for example, the link between abortion and breast cancer, Ms. Denault could not respond. He could refer her to an oncologist and we concede he was incorrect there, but he couldn't respond on the Appendix 3 of the record, which I'd like to quote for you right now. Appendix 3 says, quote, Physicians licensed to practice medicine in Olympus shall not discuss the merits of any material provided by the state of Olympus to patients as they relate to abortion. It goes on to say, they shall not critique or pass any judgment, personal, medical, or otherwise, on the propriety of abortion, the virtue of any study, even if patients allude to or ask about alternatives. There seems to be a conflict, however, between section 11 of, of Prop 417, which says doctors may give some medical advice as to if someone obtains an abortion. Two issues there that we need to clarify up front. Firstly, the Prop 417 is regulated and it's given life by the regulations in Appendix 3, and therefore Appendix 3 prohibits any discussion of the script, which is a very <coughs> wide script, might I add, so in, in effect, doctors can't say anything. But doesn't this, in fact, uh, ensure that doctors aren't going to inject their own personal ideologies regarding whether or not the, the, the uh, patient should have an abortion or not? Two responses, Your Honor. First, the court in Consulate in Edison um, versus Public Service from Corporation of New York understood that blanket prohibitions, even if they're ideologically charged, can't be forced on by the state. In that case, an electric company wanted to have inserts in customer bills describing, discussing controversial issues of nuclear energy and advancing a specific interest. The Public Service Corporation advanced the same argument, that customers shouldn't be bombarded by biased views. However, the court in that case held that even under intermediate scrutiny, a blanket prohibition of that nature was not appropriate, which goes to the third prong of the test that Prop 417 fails. The lower court erroneously relies on a county society versus Bowman and Florida v. went for it as examples of regulating professional conduct. In those situations, they were narrowly tailored laws. In a county society, very specific industry-related terms in accounting were prohibited from non-CPAs, non-certified public accounts. <coughs> in the case at bar, there is no narrow tailoring of the law. No advice, medical, personal, or other, can ever be given under Appendix 3. That isn't a narrowly tailored law, and fails both the Central Hudson test and the Constellated Edison test. Well, wait a minute, I'm not sure. I'm thinking about that Virginia case. It was about the fact that I thought the state didn't want uh, people to be confused between CPAs and just people who are public accountants. Yes, Your Honor. And uh, so that was the reason, or that was the rationale. How does that apply to our case? In fact, Your Honor, that's why we're equally confused that the lower court relied on it, relied on it, relied on it to demonstrate why Prop 417's prohibition was in fact. That's simply one more example as to why it is not particularly factually similar. That is the lower court's reasoning that under our content society, you can prohibit, prohibit professional speech in this way. While we don't think it's particularly controlling, even if it is controlling, it's an example of a narrowly tailored law. Prop 417 is not narrowly tailored. In fact, the more compelling case law in Casey, um, in which there was a compelled speech that was given, is very important because in Casey, doctors had two options. They could not deliver the script if they thought it was not in the medical interest of their clients, but more importantly, doctors could say what they wanted. There was no blanket prohibition, as we have in Appendix 3. We think those factual differences in the case at bar put it beyond the threshold that was established by this court in all of its commercial and professional speech jurisprudence, something the state of Olympus has most egregiously breached. Therefore, do you, do you take any issue with the fact that the mandated speech, that is the script that's read, tips the scale in favor of the, the mother perhaps choosing not to have the abortion? Is that something you find to be a problem in terms of limiting the doctor's speech? Your Honor, we find it to be a problem, but we recognize that this court, particularly the circuit court, not to the Supreme Court fully, have recognized <coughs> that states have the ability to choose one side that they do. However, in doing that, the states must, dem must meet the three-pronged test of regulating that professional speech. In those situations where the state, for example, in Planned Parenthood would be round, had a very emotionally charged and ideologically unbalanced script, there was no prohibition on what doctors could say. Therefore, the state, though we don't fully agree with the sentiment, didn't cross the constitutional threshold established by this court. 
the state of Olympus has crossed that threshold. And therefore, for the two reasons, one, because aspects of the speech are still ideological, which therefore restricts to an apparent issue, and the compelled speech demonstrates constitutional infirmity, we act court to reverse. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kirkpatrick, will respond. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Chief Justice, Your Honors, may it please the Court. My name is Logan Kirkpatrick, and along with my co-counsel, Mara Smiles, we represent the respondent, the State of Olympus, in the case at bar. I will be addressing the issues that arise under consideration of the 14th Amendment, and my co-counsel will be addressing those that arise under the free speech clause of the First Amendment. We ask this Court to rule that Proposition 417 does not constitute an undue burden placed on mothers seeking an abortion because it fulfills the government's legitimate interest in ensuring that the decision to have an abortion is well-informed. Excuse me. Well-informed decision only after she's agreed to have a medical instrument inserted inside of her. Correct? Your Honor, this is one requirement. Section 2 of Proposition 417 does require her to submit to a transvaginal ultrasound. Right. Not an external ultrasound. Yes, Your Honor, that is correct. It specifies a transvaginal as opposed to an abdominal ultrasound. And there will be three arguments, and this will address that specific issue provided for by respondent. The first argument is that the state has a legitimate interest in ensuring informed consent. The second is that in fulfilling this interest, the government is not placing an undue burden on the mother. And the third and final aspect is that the government does have both the interest and the effect of fulfilling this interest. Well, counsel, has this court not previously ruled on things like removing a bullet from someone, that that is too invasive and prohibited that conduct? How is the transvaginal ultrasound less invasive than removing a bullet from a murder suspect? Yes, Your Honor, that is an important question. And to address it, we need to look toward Washington v. Harper, as cited in Planned Parenthood v. Casey. In this ruling, the court determined that violations of bodily integrity can be justified only if they have, in the words of the court majority, a, quote, valid rational connection to a legitimate government interest, unquote. Now, Petitioner has already contended, they've already conceded, it was their first of their three concessions under the second Petitioner's speech, that the state does have a legitimate interest in ensuring informed consent. Now, the reason that this particular policy fulfills that ensured consent is threefold. First, it gives information regarding the gestational age of the fetus in question. Second, it gives the mother time to contemplate as to the complex moral and emotional decisions with regard to having an abortion. And finally, it protects her mental health. Gonzalez v. Carhart ruled that the mental health of the mother is essential. And the idea that mothers can suffer from a lifetime of depression, or perhaps even have suicidal thoughts after an abortion, is enough to make the state legitimate in doing everything they can to ensure that the decision to have an abortion is well informed and will not be regretted later on. So the point is to tell you the circumstances of the information provided to the mother across the line from informing her of the procedure to ensure that she appreciates the risks inherent and becoming coercive. In other words, if you have the mother being forced to view the unborn child, to hear the heartbeat, to personalize it by understanding the development of the child, at what point does this not become just simply coercive? That is a critical question, Chief Justice Paul Bryan. And the importance is to actually look at the standard established in Planned Parenthood v. Casey. This court ruled that there's one major component to what it means to have a due process requirement against an undue burden. And that is that the court cannot speculate an undue burden into existence. What this means is merely because, in the words of the court or the opinion of the court, an undue burden is believed to exist doesn't mean it actually exists. Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the majority opinion, section 5, subsection B, says explicitly that an undue burden only exists if it's factually demonstrated. And in this subsection of Casey, 298 statistical and scientific studies were shown and were included in the court's opinion in order to demonstrate that it's not just an undue burden in the court's opinion. It actually was preventing women from having this abortion procedure. Now, we have nowhere near that amount of information in the case of Barr. We have nowhere near the amount of statistical information. The only thing the court can do is speculate, Your Honors. The only thing the court can do is say that, yes, we believe this is an egregious position. And that's legitimate. But in order to show an undue burden, we need to go further. We need to show that it exists factually, not just subjectively. You mean the three of these things taken together, the five things taken together, they don't add up to an undue burden? Is that what you're arguing? What I am arguing, Your Honor, is the way we assess whether that's true 
is only through factual analysis provided by the lower court. And we don't have that factual analysis in the case so far. But it is still necessary to address, to some degree, whether subjectively the court believes the sundew burden exists. It can't be dispositive. And merely because the court uh, cannot will the sundew burden into place doesn't mean we shouldn't address it. So let's address what this means. The second thing that Casey tells us about the undue burden standard is that it's not decisional, it has to be institutional. What this means is information provided to the mother in the form of pamphlets, in the form of scripts, that cause her to change her own mind with regard to an abortion and elect not to have an abortion procedure, do not constitute a violation of her rights. So the fact that it's not complete information and she can't find out about the, uh, the studies that were done that show these alleged problems with having an abortion that she may suffer in the future. Uh, and she's not entitled to that information. Uh, so you're asking her to make a decision based on partial information, uh, which clearly from a reading of this script, uh, any person I believe would, would understand that it is leaning toward not having an abortion. Your Honor, that's not necessarily the case for two major reasons. The first is provided for in Wallen versus Rowe, I cited in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which says that there is no, never any requirement that women have all the information that the court may deem to be necessary. In other words, just because the court thinks that the mother may not have enough information doesn't constitute a necessary. That's not the situation here. This is a situation in which, by law, doctors are prohibited from answering questions a woman may have, perfectly legitimate ones, such as, Will, this, will going through with this pregnancy increase my chances of having breast cancer? It's a completely different situation, Counsel. Yes, Your Honor, that's an excellent question. And Mrs. Somerville's question was an excellent question. But they need to be addressed within the right context. And Planned Parenthood versus Casey says that it is important not to hinder the freedom of information. But also, in light of Stenberg versus Carhartt, it's clear that women don't aren't entitled to have the means of access that they want. In other words, the actual abortion provider is not the right place to achieve this information because one, there's a monetary incentive for abortion providers to place to uh, to actually go through with the practice of an abortion because that's their that's their commercial enterprise. And on page four of our record, paragraph one, it states explicitly that the commercial nature of abortion is stipulated by both parties. The, the, the statute prohibits any doctor from discussing this. It's not limited to abortion doctors. Your Honor, that is another second critical question, which has to do with the nature of alternatives. And in order to assess this, we need to look at Washington versus Harper, as cited in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which says that alternatives can come in many forms. And the alternatives specifically within this form of access can be in the form of going to the actual Department of Health's website, going to the Department of Health itself, going to other people outside of the state of Olympus, or going to people in the state of Olympus that aren't associated with- Just not a doctor. Your Honor, absolutely not. Merely this, what this is going to show is that doctors can actually provide information, but not the licensed physicians who are carrying out the abortion procedure because there's a conflict of interest, Your Honor. And, in order, in order, and this is merely ensuring that the context through which this information is disseminated is legitimate. In Casey, we approved making information available to the mother, making literature available, but do not require the mother to be suggested having it read to her. How do we rationalize this step further? further along in the process of uh, what appears to be directing the mother's decision making. Your Honor, Casey provided the foundation for Proposition 417 in two critical ways. First, ensuring that, or, or actually verifying that there is this governmental interest to ensure informed consent. And second, showing that the provision of information to the mother is an important component of that. Proposition 417 does go a step further. But the only step they take is ensuring that this information is disseminated to the mother, that it's made available to her, so that it's not hidden to her by physicians who may have a conflict of interest. But, but the, the script itself says, you should know that when it comes to, the, to abortion, there's always an immediate threat to your own health. An immediate threat. Um, so she can't ask her doctor, uh, what does this mean, immediate threat? She can't ask the doctor, uh, how, what are the chances of any of these threats listed in here happening because the statute prohibits the doctor from discussing with her. So she's got to make a decision on incomplete information. Your Honor, first of all, again, it's important to note that the same information can be gone through other means, such as by accessing the Department of Health. But more fundamentally, in response to your question, 
the nature of this script is only can only be shown to be unconstitutional if it passes if it fails to pass the test in Gonzalez versus Carhartt, a threefold test showing that the statements must be truthful, non-misleading, and accurate. And in the case Gonzalez versus Carhartt, this court actually ruled that there's giving great discretion to the states in matters of scientific ambiguity. But isn't this just plain old bullying, though? Know? Your Honor, I see that my time is beginning to expire. May I answer the question? Please do. Your Honor, bullying requires an actual intention to harm the specific individuals, and this is not at all the state's intention. Uh, Senator Ryan Manners, the primary orchestrator of this bill, on page four of the record before us today, says the intention of the bill is not to curb abortion rights, but rather to save and improve lives by ensuring that the decision to have an abortion is well-informed and maturely executed. This is the standard that was put forth. This is the standard the proposition uh, 417 upholds, and this is the standard that Gonzalez versus Carhartt found to be legitimate. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. and does not constitute a violation of the free speech rights of licensed physicians in the state of Olympus. We make this argument based on three important reasons. The first is that the physicians are acting as economic arms of the state, and thus their speech is subject to regulation by the federal government. This test would be intermediate scrutiny. Second, we assert that under the test for commercial speech developed by the Central Hudson Gas and Electric Corporation the Public Service Commission, the regulations of Proposition 417 do in fact pass. And third, Your Honor, we state, or the state holds that the regulations put in place by Proposition 417 do not infringe upon the doctor-patient relationship and do not prevent the woman from receiving medical advice from her doctor. How are the economic arms of the state? Your Honor, it has been stipulated by both parties in today's case that abortion is treated as an economic enterprise in the state of Olympus, and that all abortions are to be carried out by state licensed physicians. There are five established abortion clinics in the state in which this economic enterprise is allowed to take place. And so using the, uh, the reasoning established in the circuit court case, Accountant Society of Virginia v. Bowman. Excuse me, counsel, let me interject here. Are you saying that the entire script is commercial no portion of it is ideological. Yes, Your Honor. This council holds that the statements contained in the script refer both to the physical health of the woman and to the psychological health. And that the statements that the petitioners hold are ideological are not ideological, but are rather referring to the psychological health of the woman and that they have been misinterpreted in that sense. But you gag the doctors at that point from making any further comment about this statement, about this script. Uh, through this uh, ordinance or statute, you're gagging the doctors and telling them if you talk about anything outside this script, we're going to fine you and then take your license to, to make a living. Your Honor, respectfully, that is not the state's position. The state's position is not that the doctors have been gagged and they're not allowed to provide medical information pertinent to the woman's health conditions. The state certainly wishes that the doctor provides this medical information to the women and allows them to make fully informed consent because that is the state's interest that is being purported. However, um, under Section 11 it is of the Proposition 417, it is stated that physicians may not provide any advice other than medical about whether or not to obtain an abortion. This special uh, classification of medical advice is left so that physicians still may fulfill their role as physicians in offering medical advice. Now, under Appendix 3, Rule 3, the petitioners argue that this, um, this rule prohibits doctors, or as you would say, gags the doctors, and prevents them from being able to offer this medical commentary. But on the contrary, Your Honor, the state would find that because of the language in Rule 3, where it states the propriety of abortion, the wisdom and legality of the proposition, and the virtues of the studies, that all of these words indicate the ethical or the moral standpoint of the doctor. And so 
The state holds that while the doctor is prevented under Rule 3 from conveying their own ideological or their own moral standpoint about these issues, they are still in fact able to offer medical standpoints about, about the medical content of the studies. Such okay. as whether or not they can get breast cancer. That is correct, Your Honor. So why did you have to go to another doctor? Well, Your Honor, it is the, the opinion of the state that Dr. Denolf misinterpreted the law and that no reasonable person would read Section 11, where it clearly states that medical advice can be offered, and say that he cannot answer a simple question such as whether or not there would be an increased risk of breast cancer to Ms. Summer. So the so Ninth Circuit, in, in, um, in Walter's case, where a doctor is allowed to have free and open communication as an integral part of their practice of medicine and can therefore advise a patient as to the benefits of marijuana, medical marijuana, that is. Is that consistent with, or is that something that needs to be distinguished if this court were to try to reconcile Proposition 417 with the holding by the Ninth Circuit in Walter's? Your Honor, the state holds that allowing that Proposition 417 is not in contention with this ruling by the circuit in Conant v. Walters because in Conant v. Walters it was established that doctors have retained the right to be able to openly and frankly discuss medical factors related uh, to the woman's or related to the patient's condition. So recommending, um, discussing, prescribing medical controversial um, issues such as medical marijuana. However, in the case at bar, um, the state holds that the, the physicians are still able to openly recommend and discuss abortion. However, they are not allowed to offer their ideological or their moral, religious, political standpoint under Rule 3. So only the state can offer that. Excuse me? Your only the state can offer that in the script, where it talks about parenthood can be a rewarding and wonderful experience. That's not an ideolo ideological statement. No, Your Honor, the state would hold that the, the marginal rewards of parenthood have uh, been backed up by studies that would be d demonstrated in the pamphlet handed to the woman. And so although the pamphlet is not included in the record, and therefore we cannot quote these studies, it is presumed that given this information that is contained in the script and the information in the record that states that the information in the script has been backed up by studies in the pamphlets, we would assume that this statement that parenting can be a psychologically rewarding experience would be backed up by medical research and thus constitutes um, commercial speech within the realm of the medical field. I want to get back to your words ethical about the doctor doing all of this. It's ethical that this doctor reads his script. But seemingly it would only be ethical if the doctor could talk about the other side and give some of his professional opinion. Don't you agree? Certainly, Your Honor, and that is why the state has made an exception for the medical point of view of the doctor. Under Section 11, it states any advice other than medical about whether or not to obtain an abortion um, is not allowed, but that medical advice is allowed. And that is because the state wishes to protect this doctor-patient relationship in which this, the doctor is to provide medical information to the, to the patients. So following up on that, there are studies that say that people who have children are more stressed and, and have more troubles in their marriage than people who don't have children. So is the doctor allowed under this law to tell a woman that as medical advice, since he's allowed to tell her that parenthood can be rewarding and wonderful. Presuming that the information conveyed to the woman is limited strictly to the medical information, the medical advice of the doctor, then yes, the doctor would be able to indicate that there are other studies. He would not, however, be able to indicate whether one of those was more moral, whether one of them was more virtuous, but he would be able to indicate that another study does exist. How about more accurate? Yes, Your Honor, he would be able to, to discuss the accuracy, medical accuracy, the scientific accuracy, however not which one is more in line with his uh, moral or his, his personal virtues as a doctor. You don't think this script is bullying? Your Honor, no. The state holds that this script is not bullying because uh, particularly considering the First Amendment rights of the doctors, this is considered a disclosure or a warning to the patients regarding the procedure that he may be about to perform if the woman chooses to, to undergo this, this procedure. So you so, say it's no different than a form consent form you might sign before surgery <coughs> or list off the 50 ways you could die from this very basic common surgery. Correct. The state holds that this is very similar in nature to that given that the, this is a list of the possible risks, the side effects, 
However, the woman, after listening to it, if she still decides that she wants to undergo the procedure, she's not barred from doing so. And the speech at that, at that time, whether considering that it is restricted to medical information, is not barred. So the, if after uh, reading, reading off the list of risks and uh, disclosures, the patient has a question regarding her own medical situation, her own likeliness to suffer from one of those risks, then the doctor is allowed to answer that information or is allowed to provide advice to that effect. So are you saying that a doctor could read the script off and if the woman said, what do you think doctor could say? Well, from a medical standpoint, most of this is hooey. He could say that? Well, Your Honor, presumably if he had a medical back or if he had a medical basis for all of his statements, then I suppose yes. There is no explicit statement in, in Proposition 417 that would bar the doctor from doing so. However, he would have to make sure that he was stricking, or sticking strictly to his medical advice and not to the virtues of the studies, the propriety of abortion, these sorts of perspectives. And so, Your Honor, because of these, these reasons, because the doctor is acting as an economic arm of the state and thus subject to intermediate scrutiny, because there is a legitimate state interest in promoting the informed consent of the woman, because the doctor-patient relationship is still protected and thus the Proposition 417 does not, um, is not more extensive than is necessary. Go ahead and continue. Thank you, Your Honor. The state urges the court to find that Proposition 417 is constitutional and does not uh, violate the free speech rights of licensed physicians. Thank you. Now we're going to make the court. By the other words of the other two arguments. First, in the 14th Amendment, respondents fail to address the cumulative burden placed on women. And secondly, Respondents selectively quote their own laws in mind that are is misleading. To the First Amendment argument, Your Honor. Petitioners contend that the law permits doctors to speak freely in such a grand misunderstanding, Your Honors. That is untrue. First, Section 11 says doctors, and I urge you to search on the record, Section 11 says doctors can give no advice other than medical about whether to obtain an abortion, i.e., if we are advising the woman to have an abortion. That same section, which was not quoted by respondent, says the doctor will deliver the script pursuant to the regulations defined, determined by the State Department of Health, which is Appendix 3, page 17 of the record. I urge the justices to read that carefully. In that section, what it says is that doctors may not pass any judgment, personal, medical, or otherwise. So therefore, that section wasn't simply referring to ethical issues. It, in fact, drew a distinction between personal opinions and medical judgment. And that section prohibits the doctors from passing any medical judgment. In fact, any physician licensed in the state of Olympus, not just to perform abortions, if you read Rule 3 on its face, prohibit them from speaking about, quote, the merits of any material provided by the state, end quote. It goes on later down to also, to also indicate nothing about the virtues or propriety of the abortion or the studies. These aren't ideological suggestions, Your Honor. It makes it very clear on rules and on page 17, no opinions, personal, medical, or otherwise. That is blanket and all-encompassing. There is no nuance there from the state of Olympus. And more importantly, very quickly to your question, Chief Justice, regarding the Ninth Circuit case about Conan B. Walters, is very important because that is controlling in that that was intermediate commercial speech, professional speech specifically, but the court in that case held that the doctor-patient relationship was sacrosanct, and therefore the ability to regulate professions doesn't mean to prohibit doctor speech. Marijuana is an illegal substance in the federal law. Abortion isn't, but marijuana, marijuana restrictions were struck down because the doctor had the ability to give advice. To the 14th Amendment, we heard no response from respondents as to why, why the private insurance companies are prohibited from paying for the ultrasound procedure. This furthers no interest in the health of the mother or the child or informed consent. And when taken individually, it's on its face offensive because Ms. Somerville could pay her monthly premiums and still have no insurance, but cumulatively, it's problematic. And regarding incentive, that doctors may have an incentive to stop abortions, their concession that the state has its own agenda is an equal incentive, and moreover, asking the Sunbu to go out of state is not a viable alternative. And therefore, for those reasons cumulatively, and the fact that respondents will 
apply their own law, we urge the court to reverse. Thank you. judges of our competition. So I'm Cynthia Schmidt, uh, director of the tournament, and um, once again, I think that both teams deserve a whole bunch of applause. Let's recognize them. <laughs> As I told the um, justices when I saw them earlier this afternoon when they arrived here on day two of the tournament, um, we started off with 92 students and now you're down to four. And so I wish you could have seen all the students so you could have appreciated the masterful work that students from all over the country have done. Um, but I, I think you got a good flavor for this event from, from what you did see thus far. And I think it's very impressive considering the fact that they're undergrads. So I'd like to start off by um, introducing your panel to you all so you can better appreciate what you just went through. You think you know what you went through, but let me explain to you. Um, who you uh, made presentation to, and I think you'll be even more proud of yourselves thereafter. So, um, to our <coughs> far left, the audience is far right, um, we have Dr. Um, Judge Mark Lubit. And Judge Lubit is a real judge in Orlando, he's a circuit judge, and he's also an adjunct professor for UCF. He has a practice, or had a practice rather, of doing criminal work, criminal defense, as well as family law. And um, I was trying to figure out what I would say that would be fun and interesting about um, Judge Lubit. And I looked him up online since he was an adjunct for us. Um, and I do work here and I'm interested in how our adjuncts do. And there's this thing, sir, called RateMyProfessor.com. Have you heard of RateMyProfessor? I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> the students love you, Judge Lubit. And in fact, they were saying things like, you know, this is, I don't know how I feel about this since I'm a professor here as well. But they said that you are our best professor and that you are a genius. So thank you for being here. didn't spell genius right. <laughs> so, so thank you so much, um, Judge Lubit, for, for your assistance today with our tournament. And we would like to thank you with a plaque, sir. Oh, thank so you thank you so much. much for your assistance. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Seated to his left is another real judge, Judge Letty Marquez. And Judge Marquez is also a circuit judge here in Orlando. And um, she had a career as a personal injury lawyer and a criminal defense lawyer. And 
for those of you, well, I'm looking around the room, um, most of the people in this room, uh, to my knowledge, are not local. But if you were from Florida, you would know some of the cases that she's done that have been very high profile um, and, and in the news in the past. And so, um, also, I, one of the things I like very much about um, Judge Marquez is she's one of my very dearest friends. And in fact, um, completely redid her backyard for me so I could, once upon a time, have a wedding in her backyard. <laughs> so, <laughs> Judge Marquez. <laughs> Your chief judge is Judge Paul Byron. He is a federal judge in the Middle District of Florida, and he has served on the 11th Circuit. And so he's a real appellate judge out of Atlanta. Can you believe that you made an argument to a real appellate judge? <laughs> and so um, let me tell you a little about, about him. Uh, he was appointed um, by, or nominated rather, by President Obama, and he was confirmed by the US Senate with a vote of 94 to zero. Um, he was a lawyer for, um, the military, so that means he was a JAG a lawyer, as you know, and he also did something very interesting that I'd like to know more about another day, is he was a practitioner of international law in Yugoslavia. Um, and so please thank um, uh, Judge Byron. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next to him, we have a law professor. We made argument to a law professor, Professor Birdsong is a professor at one of the law schools here in Orlando, um, at Barry, And he also had a very interesting career with some international flavor. Um, he had a career where he was a diplomat in Nigeria, Germany, and in the Bahamas. Um, he was a lawyer in Washington, D.C., doing uh, political asylum cases. And he's been a commentator for CNN and Fox News, as well as other affiliates. Uh, last year, um, he was voted by the students at very law school. The students voted him as the professor of the year, Professor Birdson. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Ron Gilbert. And for those of you who've been here before, you might recognize uh, Mr. Gilbert. Mr. Gilbert is one of the founding partners of Colin Gilbert, Wright and Carter, and that is a personal injury firm with a presence throughout Florida, um, and they have a statewide practice, as I indicated that's been successful and multi-million dollar verdicts and recently a jury settlement to, to many millions of dollars. And um, we are so grateful to have you as our tournament sponsor. Thank you, sir, Ron Gilbert. <laughs> so what I'd like to do now is turn the floor over to the judges who will give us some brief commentary now that you know a little bit more about who they are. And then I'm going to tell them a little bit about the teams. Justices. I thought uh, all of you knew the topic really, really well. Um, you made some comments that I wasn't sure were really true <laughs> in your in your statement, um, and I didn't know that they were, whether they were contained in here. I guess it's how you interpret it. <coughs> uh, as for you, you need to slow down. You talk really fast, and you need to just slow down so that everybody can hear you and understand you, because when people talk real fast, you lose your audience. But I had told in the last group, I had told them all that they needed to put a little emotion into the argument, because if they don't, if they're not, if the, if the decider of the fact doesn't see that they're involved in it, your deciders aren't going to get involved in it. And you did. You actually, you put great expression into it. I thought it was just a great job. Um, the, uh, I thought your presentation was excellent. Um, you knew, all of you knew the subject really well, and you all, as I said to the last group, you all recovered very, very quickly and got back on track. And I think uh, for those of us who have argued in front of appellate courts and been fired at by judges on those courts, one of the hardest things to do is to answer a question and get right back on track. And uh, as I stated before, I've done about 43 oral arguments to appellate courts. And, and that's a, one of the hardest things to do, and you guys did a great job of it. You stayed on track. You guys were great. I mean, I said that last time, I'm saying it again. Very, very impressive. I wish you good luck in the next competition, all of you. Um, 
I will tell you this was a very difficult decision. I'm not going to announce it, but it was a very difficult decision. Very good job um, rearing what Judge Hayden said. Stick to your points. You guys did a good job of not backing down. You weren't going to apologize for the position you were arguing, and that's, that's great. You did a good job with that, and I was impressed. Um, you had a very difficult position to take. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, both sides, I, there's not much I can tell you other than keep doing what you're doing. You guys did a great job. You really did. I, I like the way everyone said that. Having argued many cases myself throughout my life, I think all of us who have done that understand the level of preparation it takes to be able to speak about cases off, you know, extemporaneously. You didn't have notes. You were not relying on notes. Everyone here could cite very specific detail in response to questions, so it wasn't planned. It wasn't scripted. It was something you had to know and be able to do on your feet. From the record or from the case law or cases within cases, I, I know from having on uh, cases before, that takes enormous preparation and enormous attention to detail. And Really, a spectacular memory. It was very hard to do that. You all did it brilliantly. Um, your First Amendment argument was really brilliantly done. It's very difficult. You're, you're fighting an underdog position. It's a lot easier to take shots at restricting speech than uh, than to to support you know, the obvious uh, uh, approach to that issue that seems to be more uh, susceptible to to uh, support by by the average person. But you would take difficult questions and turn them into a positive on your case. You all did that. It was done repeatedly where a difficult question came and it was then turned into a positive in your case. Uh, in rebuttal, the final summation was really well done. Uh, taking your theories and wrapping them up, that's a very important aspect of doing what you do. I like what everyone else's uh, comments that the decision is, as to who is number one, who's number two, exceptionally difficult. Just exceptionally difficult. Very, very well done. And I just forgot about halfway through that I was not hearing lawyers talking to me. And that's really remarkable. I mean, the poise and control and presence, it's really spectacular. I'm glad I'm not going to be competing with you on the private side. <laughs> <laughs> yes, again, I have to go along with what my brethren and sister on the bench have said. <laughs> Very impressive. Very impressed. Now, I have done pepper work myself in Washington, D.C. mainly. Uh, yeah, I know what it takes folks have to keep doing what you're doing. You only get better at it. Like I tell my Barry students, I do moot court for some of our Barry trial teams and moot court teams. And, you know, you only have 40 more years to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you really are way ahead of the game. The smiles, you smile. I like that. You know, I had a chance to see you before. I think you're good, but you you were tight. But you came a little bit. Strip Patrick, you are wonderful. You have good conversation. Do what to say. I'm very impressed. Mr. Waddell, I like your conversation. You were very conversational. That's one thing I try to teach our students when we do the court. Try to talk to the court. That's what you do. Mr. Melvin, you really know your stuff. Yes, you do talk a little fast, but you're very good. Just slow down a little bit. I've done that my whole life. Yes. You'll, you'll learn to just pace it down a little bit. So I've lived in the Caribbean, so I know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. But you. That's not to discourage. What you have is a lot to build on. I'd like to see all of you very well. So. <laughs> so I challenged uh, the students yesterday when I uh, was here for the welcome. And uh, I don't know if you were in the room uh, at the time or not. Uh, and, uh, and I uh, challenged you to be advocates, to no longer be students. And I'm so proud of you guys, all of you. Great job, and I know that uh, that you all are winners. I can tell you that this was a very, very close decision, a split decision of the court that you'll hear in just a moment. But I know that you four represent a whole bunch of other students, advocates that worked very, very hard as well. You rose <coughs> to the top. You're the cream of the crop, and uh, and that's the way tournaments go. There's always winners and there's always losers. But you know what? Everybody that participated in this tournament was a winner. And I was very, very impressed. Truly, uh, the level, the quality was um, uh, lawyer quality. <coughs> so congratulations to all of you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is tell you all, the panel, a little bit about the participants and tell you where they're from. This is where you finally get to hear. I'm sure you're extremely curious. 
And so I know some of you all well enough to know that some of you individually have a warm place in your heart for underdogs. And I think in some ways both of these teams are underdog teams in that the team next to me with Mr. Waddell and Mr. Malcolm, this is, their school is new at Moot Court. To my understanding, this is only their second year. And nonetheless, they made it to the final round. And so they are from Morehouse College in Atlanta. Welcome to Morehouse. <laughs> Mr. Kirkpatrick and Ms. Smiles, they are from a school that does not even have a coach. They are students who found money to come here and travel. I don't know how they trained as well as they did without a coach, um, but this is Duke University. You need to tell those people at Duke to spring for a coach. They got the money. I don't know. I don't think they <laughs> I, yeah, as a coach who brings students to this competition, going here, I'm a little bit worried about you guys getting a coach and you guys having more years under your belt as a team. So um, now is the time I'm sure you're waiting for. Could um, Dr. Schmidt please stop talking about other things? Would you like to know the outcome? Okay, it was three to two. Um, I was present with the justices as they were working on their ballots. They did not confer. It split out three to two naturally by itself because it was just, in fact, that close. Um, and to um, the coach, I, I know that your team would like to publicly thank you, sir. Can we please recognize um, um, the coach of Morehouse College? Up and get copies of the ballots later, and Duke, um, you all will be able to come up and get copies of the ballots later. So, I, at this point, would like to recognize the second place team, and we have plaques for you. And second place, um, thank you for all of your hard work. We're quite proud of you, and that is Logan Kirkpatrick and Miss Smiles. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you to our timekeeper, David, and to our videographers. And thank you again to our justices.